Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Ties Fundamental Value podcast. I am so sorry for not putting out an episode for the last few weeks or months, um, but I could not have a better guest uh, to break this radio silence that we've had. Uh, I'm super excited to be joined by Wen Long uh, from Timbusu Partners. And before we even get into it, quick disclaimer, nothing here is financial advice, but you can read the disclaimer below um, to get the full legal spiel that we have. And so, when it's so great to have you on. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. So, it's a pleasure. So why don't we start by just hearing your background before crypto? We love to start by just you know learning about people's <laughs> stories, you know, and then how they eventually found their way down the crypto rabbit hole. Uh, sure. No, no worries. How far back do you want to go? <laughs> let's go. Let's go to birth. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, um, so. I mean, for, for work-wise, before I joined Tembusu Partners, I was, I'm actually still with a, another another firm that's uh, in the ecosystem of Tembusu Partners. Um, loosely speaking, we do uh, ad hoc work opportunistically, um, Blue Ocean Capital Partners, uh, and we do that on in sort of advisory slash um, consulting basis. So I was there before that. Um, and before that, one more time, I was with a law firm. After graduation, I joined a law firm here in Singapore. RHT law. So that was what I did before that. Um, if you want to go further back, you know, in Singapore days, uh, it's in Singapore here, we do national service as well. So before that was obviously um, my uni days here in SMU in Singapore, I studied locally here in Singapore. And before that, I served in the Navy for, for during my time, which is a little bit different compared to most, most serve in the army. So they go out to, um, they go out to Takung. Uh, which is an island here in Singapore where you do the national service, but I served mine uh, on mainland because I was in the Navy as a diver. That's very cool. And so what are, I guess, the the things that you take away from your experience, you know, being in the Navy? I mean, what are the you know biggest things you remember, but, you know, kind of lessons and things that you've learned? Well, it was definitely eye-opening um, because uh, for me, it was the first time kind of really, really mixing with different people from all walks of life in that sense. And it's really the common uh, denominator across all males in Singapore, uh, male citizens in Singapore. So I really got to meet a bunch of people from all kinds of walks of life. Um, and also just remembering that that's uh, one of the things. The second was that I enjoyed my time there um, during the training phase, at least, because uh, that was when everybody was on the same page. You know, everybody was there. They were there to train and also, you know, have some have a little bit of pride in a sense, you know, as a diver, um, because uh, we, after going to hell week, after going through all the different things, then we'd be like, okay, you know, now, now we're on our journey and then we graduate together. That, that was something that I remember as well. So a chance to go overseas and get exposed to different things, which uh, I don't, I think not everybody gets to experience in most, in the, most of the lifetimes necessarily. So yeah, that was, that was very cool. I remember some of those things being uh, quite the experience actually, because uh, like, you don't often get to ride a ride a high speed boat around the entire island of Singapore. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. And so how did you go from being a lawyer to falling down the crypto rabbit hole? And when did that kind of happen? How did you get involved with the space? Well, actually it was uh well actually I feel I always feel that it's a little bit late actually. So it was uh, end twenty seventeen. Uh, and I often wish that I got involved earlier than that. Um, I think my within, was a few years, <laughs> within a few years, all of our 20, the 2017 folks are going to be OGs. I mean, maybe the second generation of OGs, but yeah, you know, yeah. we're already, we're already almost four years, you know, more than three years away. So it's, uh, yeah, that's true. That is true. Soon you're going to count it in the cycles of the halving, which halving were you at? You know, <laughs> I've been two halvings, you've been five, you know, oh, really? Okay. You know, the last, the last Bitcoin is being mined right now. Where were you? Yeah, exactly. What was the, what was the Bitcoin block reward when you first got in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I saw I got in in late 2017, uh, as I was at the tail end um, of my time with the law firm. And now looking back, I can say that back then I didn't know that I was going to leave the law firm. So it was just before uh, Christmas, actually. Well, a month uh, and a half before Christmas or so. So maybe sometime at the start of uh, November, I think, was, was roughly, the, roughly the time I got into crypto. Uh, I got into it because I heard friends talking about it. Um, and the funny thing is that they were like, oh, I didn't think you'd be interested, which is understandable given that, you know, in, I had I, I'd never done any form of investing previously. I, I, I seemed like in that sense, I might be a little bit conservative. But at the same time, I think it's a perfect fit in many ways because I've been like a fan of Kickstarter for a long time. Uh, I, I, I surf all of the different things. 
And basically, uh, it's, so I would back these campaigns and people would be like, and even so now I have friends who joke, you know, you like to, you like to buy things that don't exist. <laughs> so it's kind of like, it fits me pretty well, I would say. Buying things that space. don't exist. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's a little bit like a, on Kickstarter, right? You would back these things, which are still in beta. They're not really made yet. And so my friends would be like, oh, you know, you like to buy things that don't exist. <laughs> you, spend, you spend too much money on these campaigns. Huh? You love and magic internet money. <laughs> yeah 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 I, I i do i do yeah so i mean i fell down a rabbit hole that way um and i spent a lot i guess time looking at that space i mean towards the end of the year and also as i was clearing and leave at that point in time i was like okay you know this is something I, I i could look at and it is quite interesting um it it helped of course that it was the now looking back the crazy ico phase and you look at things and go like oh wow you know put some money here at 23x, um, 20x, right? And we're like, whoa, okay, that, that looks pretty interesting. Uh, makes the traditional 7% a year, 5% a year look kind of boring. Um, so yeah, definitely it helped to uh, it's so funny. Down. It's so funny too, my perspective has changed so much. Like I hear people being like, oh yeah, I made 30% last year. And I'm like, oh, like, you know, ETH had a 30% day last week. Like it's just, yeah, you know, yeah, Ave, yeah. Ave is up like, you know, 20 X yes. or whatever ridiculous amount in like a few so, months. So like funny story ridiculous. about Ave is that I, I actually followed them since they were land and that um, ETH land, I, yeah. I bought, yeah. So I bought into, I think there was the ICO. Uh, no, I didn't buy in the ICO. I bought into like uh, when it was like a uh, November, December, somewhere there. I can't remember the exact details. So I followed that and then I sold off and then I bought back again and then I sold off. And the only thing I didn't really buy back um, literally two days ago. I held the underlying, I was like, maybe I should buy a pub, you know, I could level like a 1.1x or something, like just a small extra. And I was like, okay, and I got busy and I was like, I didn't switch it out. So I sold it, but I didn't switch it out. And at 302 to 497 and five, oh, I was like, wow, I missed that, man. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, man, that's unfortunate, but okay, you know, gains are gains. Okay, so, so how did you get from you know, discovering crypto, right? Seeing this ICO boom, right? To start talking about investing in ETHLAND. Like how did that, how did that happen, right? And, and how did that lead you to Tembusu? Okay, so what had happened is that I actually looked at different um, ICOs back then. So I have friends, oh, check this out. And I have friends who be like, oh, check that out. So I, I pretty much follow the same ideas, of course. Now, like since then, so now it's been obviously iterated numerous times. And obviously doing it like personally versus like as a fund or as a firm is very different. But what we, what I, I did at the start was to get behind the story. Uh, a big part of, a big part of the, the, the things which I have often um, thought about is the story and the narrative, right? So the, the narrative is important to me and I find that that's a big part of it. It's, it feels, it feels like, uh, sorry. <laughs> Um, so it feels like that there is a big part of all of this, which is the narrative and the narrative is important because what story you're telling, where you're going makes a difference to whether I follow your project, right? Uh, to know how serious you are in the building, to know what problem you're trying to solve. You know, these, these are things that are important. It's, it's a little bit like, I like to joke with friends, you know, Kickstarter products are too different in the sense of, do I buy? Uh, the fact that you're going to be able to deliver. Do I buy the fact that you are having something that I need, right? Or people around you need. And I think it's not too different in that sense. The narrative makes a big part of it. And, and so what are some narratives that really have stuck with you these last few years? Well, I think the one that's recent, everyone has been talking about is GameStop, right? Um, there's that narrative in the sense of, you know, I think I was listening to an interview that Katie Wood did and she was surprised. She learned something new there as well in, in terms of how you could actually short a stock more than a hundred percent. That was new for her. That's definitely new for me. Um, and, and just knowing that, that these inefficiencies in the system still exist is one thing. I think uh, the other side of it is that the decentralized narrative is something that led me down the, you know, the entire crypto space, right? So before that, I had heard of Bitcoin. I was I heard of it in, in law school actually, but unfortunately it came coupled together with uh, the, a class I was in called corporate crime. So unfortunately I didn't buy any Bitcoin back then, right? Um, although if my brother listens to this podcast, he'd be like, dude, I listened to, I, I, I saw the Bitcoin white paper when it was 80 bucks or maybe a hundred bucks. 
Although as poor students, we're like, okay, you know, maybe that's not something we want to do some some of right now. Um, and also, of course, the fact that back then you thought of Bitcoin as one whole thing, and if you didn't buy one, maybe it's not worth it at all. Um, but clearly, fractional fractional purchases would have been great as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that that shift and knowing a little bit more some more information along the way helped move down that that rabbit hole more. If, so to answer the question more directly, the decentralized narrative is something that's, I think, a very, very big part of crypto, obviously. And the fact that you do enable people to control some of, the, some of their own assets and also maintain ownership of you know, the things that they've worked pretty hard on, I think that's a big part of the narrative as well. And so tell us about Tembusu, how you ended up there, what Tembusu is, the background of the firm, and, and how it found itself in the cryptocurrency world. Sure. So Tembusu is a, well, we're, we're Singapore-based, clearly. Um, and we are we started off as a private equity firm uh, with a pan-Asian focus, really. And the fact that Singapore is a hub in, in, in many ways, and we've, the government has built uh, this the landscape and structured us as a hub into Southeast Asia. And that's a, that's a narrative that I'm hearing a lot of when you see these, even these crypto firms or traditional firms come to Singapore. I mean, now you've got Ray Dalio trying to set up his family office here. You've the new announcement with Google's, uh, with um, one of the Google founders setting up the office, the family office here. I think that's a narrative that people do buy into that Singapore is a nice transition uh, into the, the region. Because Singapore itself is a very small economy, a very small market, but the fact that within the eight hour radius, you have a lot of that. So uh, Singapore, that's how we position ourselves at Tembusu, uh, as supporting companies that want to come here, set up in Singapore, and also that we can work alongside with. So we start off as a private equity firm, and we've done three growth funds. I like to say, pun intended, I think you've heard this before, but we've ventured into the VC space uh, in the last few years. Uh, 2015 or so, we started a, an ICT fund an ICT fund that's now fully deployed. And we then started the blockchain fund sometime in 2018. How we got started is through our managing partner, Mock, and now we have Kung on board as well. But Mock is an old friend of our chairman, Andy, and they got together and said that maybe there's something here that we could do here, given that you know, there's been a lot of talk about this space. And Mock is the ex-CTO of Starhub here in Singapore. So Starhub's the second largest telco in Singapore. And if you're looking at it and going, this it might change quite a lot of things. And this is something that we could explore. I think that's how the conversation got started, actually. And then from there, after I joined, then we had uh, you know deeper conversations about what this looks like and some of the deals that I brought to the table as well. Yeah, and so so tell us, well, actually, before we even go down the rabbit hole, so what is the split of Tembusu now between private equity and VC? Right, right. So actually, a lot of the focus is on VC at the moment, actively anyway. What we do in recent years actually is that we have managing partners come in and manage the funds. So we run a pretty lean shop in that sense. Then each of these managing partners are in charge of the area that they've discussed with the, with the chairman. And then they would set out onto, you know, sort of each of their paths. So it could be, it could be like a joint venture. It could be VC. P is not something we've done very much recently. Although there are, there are things that they invest in. Uh, ad hoc along the way as well. Still. And so tell us about the blockchain fund. So what 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 types of things, you know, did you initially set out to invest in? Um, has that changed over time? Are you investing in companies? Are you investing in tokens? Are you investing in enterprise blockchain, crypto? You know, can you kind of tell us, you know, how, how capital is being allocated by that fund? Sure. So first of all, the blockchain fund is, loosely speaking, a fund. What we've done is to put partners money together as well as some of the balance sheet money. So we haven't actually raised any external money at all. And we are considering doing that sometime later this year. Okay, maybe that's a bit of a plug. <laughs> but uh, so what we've done so is- So if somebody that, hypothetically wanted to yeah. reach out about investing, how could they find out? Let's just throw that in right now. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, you can contact me at my email. Um, so it's Wenlong, W-E-N-L-O-O-N-G at tembusupartners.com. I'm not as active on Twitter as I probably should be. I lurk around the Twitter space, but I don't really post much. Although my, my handle is at Walawenlong, which is a very Singaporean um, reference. So that's W-A-H, W-E, sorry, W-A-H, L -E we'll, throw it, we'll throw it in the description. Don't worry. Don't, don't okay. write it down. Yeah, <laughs> sure. 
Yeah, so you know the the idea there is that we we have done investments into uh, digital assets, uh, crypto, and we actually have not really done equity investments yet, because the timeline wise is actually pretty long. And when we first started, a lot of crypto people and a lot of the people who were interested in the space were looking and going, "Why should I put my money in equity when I'm interested in a shorter timeline, you know, a time horizon?" And I think that's changed a little bit now that crypto is a little bit more mature, and people are going, "Okay, now I can see these companies lasting a lot longer, with the Coinbase IPO looming, and you know, things becoming a bit more real." So we definitely do invest in digital assets and tokens. We did one investment you know, into an equity company. Oh, sorry, an, into, for equity into a company, but that hasn't turned out the way that we expected it yet because the company is a travel company, travel related, and you know, given that we're having this call and we're not doing this like face to face as as far as possible, is a sign of the times, I, I would say, right? So that's a uh, one thing that we we have done. We've done investments into digital asset space. And so, tell us about these token investments that you're making. What stage are you investing at in these tokens? Is this, is this ICO stage? Is this, you know, is this, you know, like how big are these assets? You know, is there a specific size allocation that you're trying to make in each, each of these things? I mean, are you trying to get us a, a small piece of a lot of assets, a big piece of a few assets? Kind of, you know, talk us through what you're actually allocating into. Sure, we've only done five investments to date. And that's because what we've done is to try and iterate our investments thesis, so that you know I like I like to joke that if any money is lost, it's our money first, so that when people come in, they will make money. Good thing is that we haven't lost any money. That's a great thing. And in fact, I would say all the investments so far have, have turned out pretty pretty well. And I think that's because we've been very careful about it. So the first one we did is into ontology in March 2018 before I joined. That's definitely still active. Uh, the last I checked, because I had to prepare for a board meeting coming up, there's uh, really they've done some work with Daimler for 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 their automobile ID actually, and so they're still active definitely. Then we did an investment uh, after I joined. We did an investment into Clayton, which is Cacao's blockchain subsidiary. That that story there is actually quite interesting because. Is that a li- that's a liquid token? I don't think I've heard of it before. Yeah, it is actually. It is. I think uh, so. Now, 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 if people watch this, they're gonna be aware of it. It's not on Coin Market Cap very clearly, because the tokenomics uh, have not been published, uh, not on Coin Market Cap at least. And well, it feels like I'm shilling my bags here, right? But the, <laughs> but the but the idea it's not is on Coin Gecko. It's not on Coin Market Cap. It's not even on Coin Paprika. It's nowhere. No one's ever heard of it. But but Tembusu has a stake. No, I'm just I'm just messing. Tell it. Tell <laughs> us about it. And you know, is it is it launched? Is it a live? Token? Actually, it's on Coin Gecko. So oh, it's on. Okay, can, there we you, go. Yeah, it is on Coin Gecko, uh, but it's not. It, you can't rank it well because they don't. They haven't. They haven't disclosed a number of things. You have CrossAngle.io, which has more information on that. Just that it's not on Coin Market Cap. I think that's partially intentional, actually. So. Because in, in Korea, I think they're really cautious about the regulations. And so, well, I mean, to finish the story there first, we invested in the earliest round possible at Kakao sub, blockchain subsidiary called Clayton, uh, the Clayton network at least, and, and run by Ground X. So that came about because I was talking to a friend and catching up with a friend and going, you know, oh, I've, I've moved and we we're catching up. And he was saying, oh, then you should check this out. He actually mentioned another project first. And then he mentioned this one. I said, no, this one's interesting because we can see the potential of this. We can see what it might do. And so we pursued the conversation and we finally invested and completed the investment sometime in March 2019 after I joined uh, and we started conversation sometime in December 2018. So, I mean, to, to answer the question more, though, that was the second investment. I, I mentioned five and then we invested into Blockstack, which you guys are very familiar with in the US. Uh, and it's Stacks now, right? I think they changed it. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So Blockstack, you know, Blockstack Foundation, and then the split into Hero, and then Stacks version 2, which we are pretty excited about. And how they've moved, the, they've kept to their vision of proper decentralization. And also now that they are declared not a security, and US people can invest directly straight away. 
Then we also did another two companies on the way, finished off with one last year, which is a smaller exchange. Uh, they just launched it. They just are launching their token sometime in this first quarter, hopefully by end Feb, Delta Exchange. Ah, we so had, we had Pankaj on the podcast uh, a couple uh, uh, episodes ago and he was discussing the token launch. So, that, yeah, uh, so I think so, that's going to be a good one. Yeah. He seems to be a great, uh, a great leader and they seem to have a lot going on there. Lots so that's what we've been, we've been, that's the, the only investment we did in 2020. And then what's yeah. the fifth one? So there was one in between, which is the equity one that I mentioned. Oh, gotcha. So one in between, but that hasn't really been a blockchain investment so far because they were going to build, but obviously having to hold the storm in 2020 has forced them not to build anything there yet. So that was a good one in the works, but that's something that needs to be you know, moved along as, as we go. So I've caught, I've caught up with them recently to see what they've been up to. They are still doing well in the traditional side of business, which is doing guest houses in Korea and managing to even kind of expand that. But whether they become a blockchain company and, and use any of that is something that we still need to manage. Got it. And so how do you get started when you guys decide you want to allocate to an a, a crypto, right? Well, one, are you, are you actively due diligence in other, other assets to invest in? And two, if you are, what are the things that you're looking for, right? What are, what are the questions that you're asking yourself when you're deciding whether to allocate and are you being approached by tokens or are they approaching you? Well, it's both. But before I, I answer that, actually, I think you asked a little bit earlier about whether we in, in, invest into enterprise. Uh, the answer is no. So far, we've not done anything unless you consider the Clayton one, which can do a little bit of private network and, and things like that enterprise. I think the reason for that is crypto itself is decentralized, right? And so the enterprise side of it, it is quite one, it is quite difficult to invest in, in in that sense. And the second is that it doesn't really really fit ethos if I, if I were to mention mention it in that light because it doesn't really go decentralized right and that's that's a conversation that was i think a 2019 2020 kind of early 2020 kind of conversation right it's still gonna stay it's just something that we don't really see how we can invest into as well so to answer that part of the conversation before we, we move on yeah yeah i mean so, i also yeah. i mean i see a lot of enterprise blockchain companies that are out there like axani you know and, and others and they have these crazy valuations and they may be doing great things but it's just it's so funny how you know, back in 2017 or even before, blockchain and crypto was this. It didn't matter enterprise, blockchain, Bitcoin, whatever. It was all the same discussion. And it's funny just seeing how over the years, this industry has just spread out. I mean, before we were joking about mining and like our day to day doesn't like mining is not part of it, but that's a massive part of the crypto industry. And I think enterprise Absolutely. blockchain is just so far, you know, kind of off the face of the crypto map now, which is just kind of funny. Right, where it's just yeah, not yeah, that's, 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 a, that's absolutely right. But if you ask me to invest in equity in a company that might, let's say, create a private network for investors and tokenize that, okay, maybe that's that's more in something that we could consider, for example. Yeah. And so, and so, yeah, kind of to my to my next question, which was the actively looking at assets. Uh, so, what is the process when you're deciding whether to allocate to an asset? I mean, you've made very few investments, so I'm, I'm assuming it's you know, you're doing a tremendous amount of due diligence before you're allocating. So can you kind of, you know, tell us about that? Sure. I think what we've done, it's two ways. Like I said, we, we reach out, uh, I reach out. So like I said, we run a very lean shop. I am pretty much the only staff on the blockchain fund in that sense. Uh, we do have the backend people managing accounts and different things like that, but I do basically reach out like how I actually reached out to you and to learn a little bit more about the work that you guys do. And there are definitely projects that I refer to as well, friends in the in the community. So, I mean, I, I've heard your previous episodes and I definitely agree with a lot of the communal focus, right? Which is that there's a lot of people in the community and people suggesting, hey, you should speak to this guy. Oh, and then they'll, they'll be, obviously on their side, the conversation will be like, oh, you should speak to one long who's at Tembusu because they are active, they're doing these single things. And we stayed active throughout the whole bear market. We, in fact, started, if you if you look at the timeline wise, towards the tail end of the of the bull market or at the start of the bear market in March 2018. So we've been active the whole entire time. We've seen hundreds of projects, met a lot of them, and, and we start conversations. I'm always willing to have a conversation to see what the project is about. I guess the narrative is really important to me. And then the next step will be to figure out where that fits within what we see uh, the future looking like. 
or what the theme is at the moment. So for me right now, a lot of the theme is data, which is how I even had the conversation with you in the first place, right? As I mentioned, uh, back in the, I think it was December or so now. Uh, December? Was it December? Early December, I think. Could, yeah, early, could have even been earlier. Yeah, and yeah. time flies. So, so data and also some of the complementary services around all these things. So there's a lot of people looking at protocols and we still look at that. We don't, we haven't done any like super deep dive technical due diligence in that sense. What we do is really from more from a business perspective. And then we ask the usual VC questions, right? And so that answers a little bit of the stage as well. Given that we have only deployed our own money, it's been smaller ticket sizes anywhere from 250k to 500k, maybe a little bit more than that. This is a typical check size. We haven't done very much in that sense in terms of check size, but what we've done is to go into these ecosystems, right? So because of investing into ontology, we can speak and look at the ecosystem because of investing into Clayton, we can have a peek into the ecosystem as well and have conversations there. Because of that, we've had multiple conversations and doing something like Clayton allows us a lot of access, I would say, especially in Korea, because everybody knows Kakao. Everybody in Korea uses Kakao. SMS can you, can you by the way, number. I'm actually yeah. not familiar with what Kakao is. So can you tell the uh, listeners and myself uh, right. what it is? Sure. I mean, so I think in, in, in that sense, uh, a comparison to WeChat would be quite complimentary. Yeah, so it's, it's like the WeChat sense. of Korea. And so Kakao is at its highest level. It's really a public company that has multiple subsidiaries uh, slowly going public in that sense. So Kakao Games went public in 2020, and that was a resounding success when, when on, on Bell Day, right? And then you had, you, I think they're trying to do Kakao Pay from what I heard. I mean, not from Kakao guys, so just put it out there, right? <laughs> um, no special insider information there for sure. But the idea is that they, they seem to want to grow each of the subsidiaries into publicly listed companies. And obviously with the decentralized side of it, that's... Uh, way more challenging and not so easy. But when we first invested, even in 2019, what we foresaw is that they could put a wallet into every single Kakao user's mobile, right? Because almost like based on based on different research or different findings, somewhere between 90 to 97% of all Koreans use Kakao, Kakao Talk as a messenger, right? And so it's the sheer dominant play in in Korea and so by and they have done that now actually they have put a wallet for their token into every single one of these and they can send these tokens if people are aware because they haven't publicized it as much yet but they can do that and we saw that to be instantly something that you would go wow that's really powerful so yeah, I mean, one, it sounds like yeah. it should be a much bigger deal than I think it publicly is I mean is it listed on BitSum and the other Korean exchanges so it's not listed on BitSum it's listed on coin one it's listed on up bit Okay, it's and the other it's, big ones. Yeah, so so they are, I think, going to hopefully this in other places as well this year. But I think that's also something that's uh, part of the conversation as they pay attention to some of the crypto regulations because Kakao is very popular and they want to stay, obviously, reg regulated. Right, I mean, and, and I guess Telegram blew up on their token offering and Kick blew up on their token offering too. So exactly. both the other messenger apps token offerings completely blew up. So what is the, you know, what are the token economics behind Clayton? What gets you excited? You know, how as an investor, you know, beyond just the fact that this wallet is going to exist on people's phones, do you see that investing in Clayton, you know, will, 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 will help you kind of achieve a strong return on investment? Well, so to date, it's already been a strong return on investment. So I can't complain there for sure. We invest in the earliest round possible. So if we lose money, everyone else loses money. I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so that that's a great thing to know. So it's a it's it's something that I was quoted on. I think in a paper that's coming out uh, by Hashkey actually, because Hashkey invested too, and and so I was I was interviewed by Hashkey, and I think the paper is going to be coming out somewhere in this quarter or so. But I absolutely think it's good to be early, and and so to go back one step in, in where we invest, it tends to be early because we are small check sizes. And although we, I would say we are open to investing at later stages, the valuations just go a bit nuts, right? Yes. For some it's of ridiculous. Them. Did you yeah, see so this flow launch? That I did. In fact, I, I, I was, I, I complained to people internally because the ones representing them here in Singapore, Spartan came to me and I met him late and I said, this is interesting. I think it's going to do well. But because you're we so late and then the Dutch auction had happened, 
I was going to have a further You're conversation. Yeah. And I was like, oh no. And I even followed up with the OTC guys. Is there any word? Is there any word? And they was like, no, so far there's no word. And the reason there's no word because everybody's going to hold it, right? And like, wow. I mean, this, yeah, for anybody who doesn't know, I mean, one of the things about token launches is the fact that sometimes the launches aren't necessarily the best for later stage investors is the nice way That's of putting right. it. And so in the case of Flow, basically the way that they launched this and Flow was created by Dapper Labs, which is the inventors of CryptoKitties and now NBA Top Shot, which is the hottest thing or was the hottest thing for a week. I don't know if it's still the hottest thing. Um, but basically they launched a, their own blockchain because the Ethereum blockchain, I don't know if anybody remembers, but back in 2018, every transaction on Ethereum was CryptoKitties and gas fees went through the roof. CryptoKitties is like a non-fungible token. It's a virtual kitty. I don't know. It's a virtual kitty cat. That's the best way I can explain it. And so whatever, they, they made their own blockchain because Ethereum could not handle the transaction size for virtual kitty cat trading. Exactly. And, and so basically... What they did is, you know, they launched this, you know, this token finally launched for trading, but the way that they basically launched it is it's only the early investors where they were able to stake their tokens and earn rewards. And what happened was the only, you know, you know, percentage of the tokens which have, have been unlocked are basically the staking rewards for the early investors. So the asset was listed on Kraken and a bunch of different exchanges, but only less than about one to 2% of the supply is unlocked, which means that it's going to inflate by, you know, 75 X, um, you know, over the next few years. And so, you know, the assets trading at, I think now maybe $8, but it was trading at $12, which is an implied $15 billion market cap at one point. I think now it's $13 billion or whatever astronomical amount, which is wild. Like this thing just launched. And I think to your point, like some of these valuations, just how could a blockchain for virtual kitty cats be worth $13 billion? I don't understand who's, who's investing in this. Right. So I would have done that because in terms, I mean, so as a fund, we still need to generate returns, right? So not everything can be literally just belief driven in that sense. Although we, right. we, some of it does need to be returns. And I saw this as it would be wildly popular. One, you've got the guys behind CryptoKitties. Two, now they created an entire universe around it. And three, I just thought that, you know, if you are that early, I think you, and you believe the narrative and the, what they've done, then it would generate returns, which is exactly how we've done whatever we've done so far. Right. Well, I think, I think in the case of this in flow, I mean, I think anybody who was an early investor, any VC is going to make a tremendous amount of money. It's just exactly. if you're in now, you're going to, you know, you're, you know, I don't think the opportunity exists. Now maybe you trade it, just yeah. trade it in and out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, if you're talking, if you, to take one step back, if you're talking about Clayton, I think what gets me excited is the fact that they're trying to build the governance council as well. They've been doing, they've started with really large Korean conglomerates. So, and you also have, I mean, so just to put it out there for people to learn a little bit more. I'm part of different chat groups. I see people mention it. Uh, they've heard, some, of their, some of their dApps have appeared on State of the Dapps before. And so people, I, I'm not very active in chat groups. I just like to see people, what they talk about, you know, like a lurker. And so I just look at it and go like, oh, that's great to know, you know, people are noticing a little bit and like, where's this from? Have you guys heard of these guys? Are they even real? I'm like, mm, yeah, they, they, are, they are pretty real, <laughs> except that I'm not going to take a public conversation about that because these chat groups can be quite challenging at times, right? Unless you belong to really good conversation ones. Um, but yeah, so what, what made me really excited is the fact that they're building their governance council. They've got very large governance council members who are, I would say, decently active. And in fact, Fidelity, uh, World Pay by Fidelity is part of the governance council right now, actually. And so I think I would suspect they can do some work there as well. So I got I got to look this up. So what is the market cap on Clayton right now? So that's the thing. People don't know what the market cap is because oh, it's not public supply. information. And that's exactly why the coin market cap information is not going to be very useful. And so I what, think are you going to are you going to tell the world what Clayton's supply schedule is? Are you going to? Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm not uh, not putting it on you. But uh, so, X angle cross angle dot io. It's actually all there. Cool. So. So, yeah, so what is, you know, so on, on these next investments, right, you know, I, you mentioned Blockstack. So when you're looking at something like Blockstack, what gets you excited, right? You know, what, what, what leads you to invest in that? And when you're making that allocation, what is the time horizon that you have? Sure. So I think any of these projects, if you really want to see traction, you're going to wait two to three years, at least in that sense. 
you can make a quick buck if your if your unlock schedule is is you know really short and things like that. But it does go back to VC investing in many ways right? because you are asking yourself certain questions. One, if you're in there for like two months, is that something you believe in, or is that something that you're really just wanting to make a quick turn on, right? And so there's nothing that we've invested in that we simply turn around within two months or three months. I mean, um, the second thing is that, I mean, with a lot of these solid projects, the founders are aligned with the project itself. And so their, their interests are aligned with how long they're going to be there. And for Blockstack, I think when we spoke to Munib when, when, when travel was still possible and he was here in Singapore, I had a really great conversation in terms of just how smart he is and looking at the space and also his belief about the system and the way things should work. And of course, he's also, a, like later on, uh, what got me extra excited about that is that he's appeared in George Gilder's book, right? Um, and also his company is referred to in Silicon Valley in one of the episodes as well, just in terms of how plugged in he is into the ecosystem and the kind of work that they've done. And the fact that they've tracked their milestones along the way is absolutely fantastic. And so what are you most excited about in terms of, you know, sectors of the crypto market or specific topics right now? Like, are you interested in DeFi, NFT, stable coins? I know you, you mentioned data. And so, you know, I'd love to kind of hear the token side of that. Um, and maybe you're interested in Ocean Protocol and some of these other data focused tokens as well. But then we can also, you know, dive into, you know, actual equity investments. So it's a funny story on Ocean Protocol as well, because I mean, they've done, they, they're here in Singapore, in Berlin as well, I think. So they set up in Singapore. We've had a conversation with them before. When I, before I joined Tembusu, I actually made a small, back then I think the allocation was like one ETH max, each person or something. And I, and my friend didn't want to do the whole ETH. So I took half the ETH, he took half the ETH. I'm like, okay, sure. Right. And and the thing is that they've, they've taken a really long time. So with their whole IEO on Bittrex, no shade there, but it's just basically the fact that they didn't do well on the IEO uh, and that comes to the prices. Uh, I wasn't paying attention to tracking them as much back then, so I would have bought a little bit more, but they've done pretty well on that front. And I think they've also got new new projects building on them right now. So I think that's quite promising uh, on the data front. But of course, there have been there have been projects that have not really worked out. Data Wallet is one from, from long ago. It was its idea was to try and plug you into Spotify and different things and use data. So that hasn't really worked out. That was more of a personal side of things. No, yeah, no I mean, fun I investment there. There are also yeah. a lot of a lot of the ICO, I mean the utility token craze, right? There's so many utility tokens. I mean, there was something called Syndicator. I don't know if you remember that. There was something yeah. Santiment yeah. at one point. I mean, they uh, they had a market cap of like four hundred million dollars. They're down to like ten. Um, so a lot yep. of these utility token data companies, um, you know, are just, there's nothing going on there. Yeah. I was a bag holder for syndicator. I think at one point in time I held it, I think still, I think I still hold a small amount actually. So oh, I got to see that market cap. I got to see that. Market it's, cap. it's tiny. It's, t it's they've, they've launched this thing now called stoic the last I checked. So I did a little bit of like checking in on how that's doing. They did launch this thing called Stoic, which is doing like automated investing, as far as I remember. And so they were like, "Oh, we outperformed Bitcoin and things like things like that as well." Which is okay. I mean, they pivoted a little bit, trying to make you sound. Yeah, they're up. They were at seven million market cap April last year, back up to uh, twenty twenty nine. They've uh, twenty seven. They've come out, come from the dead a little bit. So, yeah. so, so in terms of sectors though, and topics in crypto beyond data, what has you interested? I mean, what are your what's your take on DeFi? Are we in a bubble? Are we near the top? Where are we going? So DeFi is something that we, that as a firm, we've not really explored much. I myself have not really explored it as much as I, I think I want to pay some attention to it just because I think that it's, a, I would liken it to a little bit like the ICO phase, but at the same time, you do have solid things that solid projects that came out of the ICO phase and they made use of the same systems, right? So very much like Delta as well, some of these things that came out of the DeFi space, so I mentioned Delta Exchange earlier, the fact that they will have a, a pool there as well. And that allows some of these companies to bootstrap, to bootstrap some of these liquidity and also to generate, right? Because Delta is going to, Delta, Delta Exchange will have pool of its own. And what, what that will allow is for one, their own stakeholders to put some of their money to work. At the same time, because they are an exchange and they do have the market making function and things like that as well. 
And what that allows is for them to generate certain kinds of returns and then also bootstrap themselves towards a larger, to become a larger player in the ecosystem. So I think you do have some things that are pretty useful in the space. I don't dare comment too much in, in the DeFi space as well because I don't really know it in depth, but I think there are definitely interesting ideas in that. And given the fact that I looked at ETH Lend when it was still ETH Lend and, and how now it's a blue chip in, in, in the DeFi space, so it's so speak. funny that we're already calling things blue chips in DeFi. I mean, yeah. So it's it's interesting because I think that they will. So it's a little bit like good large companies, right? They 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 last, and with a large enough market cap, what they will be forced to do is to pivot and to make use of new trends, hopefully in, in good ways, right? So the thing is that I, I read this quote somewhere, although it's not. It's not exact or necessarily true all the time, but as money gathers and it becomes larger, it tends to become smart money because you do need to find ways to deploy. You need to find, you need to find ways to make the most of it. How can they multiply that as well? Right. And, and you see that in, even in the general markets, when you have, I mean, now, now it's really quite questionable how, how wise that is if the whole game stops scenario and depending on how people hold and, and things like that, but as money gathers, people become more concerned or more cautious about how it's deployed. And I think that does hopefully lead to a virtual cycle in terms of, okay, if let's say you had a billion dollars today, you can't invest the same way as when you had a million dollars, right? You can't, because you would move the markets. How do you allocate that properly and things like that? So with these larger companies, how do they expand their business, right? Same thing as Amazon when it's so large, you know, when you have these companies that are or like these projects that grow larger and they're like now blue chip, then what happens is that how do they pivot? How do they grow? How do they make use of these new areas, which maybe weren't part of the original thesis when they first started? I think that is what's interesting to watch. And that's what will come out of the DeFi space really strong, given that they have added new things, which people didn't think of before. And, and that's something that when people put together with other parts of the ecosystem and synthesize it in a new way, maybe you can have a lot of technically incremental innovation, but when you read, when you repurpose things and you re-architect it, it's a little bit like some of the structures of Bitcoin existed before that. But when you put it in a new framework or a new architecture, then things change completely because the fundamental existence of it has changed. And so what do you think is overhyped in crypto? I mean, I know you mentioned that some of these tokens have crazy market caps, but, but broadly speaking, I mean, where, where do you think there's a bit too much hype? I think where there's too much hype is how quickly we're going to get to adoption in some sense. I, I think it's going to take time. Today, the internet is quite prevalent, but we forget that there are places in the world that people don't have internet access. There's also, and also the fact that we come from, I mean, you and I, okay, you're speaking over the internet, doing things a certain way. We come from a certain privileged background already in, in a certain degree, a certain way. When we're talking, when we're talking about adoption, I think we mean adoption in these places. That's one, right? And of course, when you talk about people wanting a 1.6 billion kind of a 1.6 billion people using the ecosystem, 2 billion and things like that, we also need to keep in mind what adoption really looks like or to frame that differently. So I think adoption will still, will still take some time. You would see institutions coming in and things like that, but it will take time. I think we still need to learn to be patient, right? as we go back to the 23x, 30x kind of scenario. What crypto does that overhypes things is the kind of returns and the expectations there of how quickly that will be picked up. Even till today, not every company uses cloud. So that's something that I think will take longer than we expect, unless you've got a 10 year time frame, then maybe it might be a bit more <laughs> than you expect. And so you uh you mentioned um you know quickly there or 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 for a bit um adoption and so being in singapore i'd love to get your take on you know what crypto adoption looks like specifically within singapore both from a retail and an institutional point of view but also broadly across southeast asia and not just among those with necessarily a more privileged background like many in singapore and hong kong and south korea and other places but you know also in countries like the philippines you know, where hypothetically crypto could be used for remittances. And I know, I think coins.ph is one of the bigger, you know, bigger players out there. I'd love to kind of get your take, you know, kind of across Asia, but let's start with Singapore on what adoption looks like in 2021 
versus what it looked like in early 2020, 2019, et cetera. I think there are two parts to that conversation there because you can have the top-down approach, which is like institutions adopting some of it and then making it into something which these people can have some access to, uh, which is the retail, right? And, and I think that is gonna happen. And that would be interesting to watch you in some of the conversations I've had with people, people plan, they are plans to make a Bitcoin pension trust of sorts, for example, right? And I think that'd be really interesting because you could go like, oh, okay, now I have a different form of generating returns and, and yield for some of these things, which maybe retail could get into a little bit more. If pension, if pension funds are willing to touch it and the bigger players like BlackRock that manage pension funds and things like that also start exploring it, then you could have retail and the space a little bit more. Well, kind BlackRock of filed uh filed yeah. the other day saying you know which in their filings mentioned bitcoin so yeah yeah so i heard i heard that amongst the clients it was generating a lot of buzz as well so that was that was interesting and of course that's keeping the door open doesn't mean anything per se but it's keeping the door open and that's that's promising for all of us here in the space. a lot it's a lot right. more than we had two years ago in 2018 oh, when sure. bitcoin fell to three thousand dollars and you know none of us knew if we were gonna have jobs you know a month from a month from now you know, you're touching on a point which is actually very real because when I joined after a while, I'm like, is this really going to stay? <laughs> I'm a little bit worried at times, to be honest, because it's like, okay, I believe this story, this narrative, but right now as it's playing, I'm not so clear, <laughs> right? Yeah. Times along Am the I way, the it's only like... one who believes this narrative? And if that's the case, I still, I still remember my, my sister actually like a year ago, she's like, what are you going to do, you know, if, if this doesn't work out i'm like of course it's gonna work out what are you talking about of course bitcoin's gonna exist right right but yeah we we're exactly. all skeptical for a little bit it's good when you're, you're you're doing it on the side and you have got a real job but when you're doing this full time you're like um okay you know this is a better workout in some ways right well it's good in 2018 when you're doing it off the side but now the fact that we we lived through 2018 2019 2020 and we're here now we're much better off being in this industry than for sure, absolutely, uh, absolutely on the side. And, and that's a good, that's a that's a good thing to have, especially as we start twenty twenty one and you see more people looking in the space, right? And, yeah, and, yeah, so. and, and so kind of back to the question though. So in terms of retail adoption in Asia, what are you seeing? Um, you know, is it you know we, we've we've heard a lot or we hear a lot in the West about a lot of the adoption being speculative uh, in nature. Um, you know, a lot of it being younger people. You know, potentially in South Korea, in Japan, in 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 mainland that are just trading, uh, and not really investing. And so, I'd kind of love to get your take on you know if that is the case, and you know if so, if that's changed over time. Sure, I think, I mean, to answer as well, the second part of it, it could be a retail driven from the bottom up, right? Which is something that crypto was at the start. So when I mentioned earlier, you have the NC coming in, and I think at some point in time, we do need the institutions to show interest and to take a real stake. So that there'll be a trust of sorts, especially for the people who were burned in the 2017, 2018 craze of the ICOs and lost a lot of money, for, for instance, right? Of course, over institutional over institutionalization will also cause problems because then you know if they really start buying up chunks of the ecosystem, then what really happens there, right? So I think that does need to be managed. But if you if you talk about the second part, which is retail driven and how much adoption there is on the ground, I would say actually the adoption is still limited, to be honest. A lot of it is looking at returns, which is not wrong because we are looking as realistically speaking, we are looking at for ways to one, at least ensure that your money doesn't cur like erode with time, the value of that money. Uh, and two, I think the other side of it is that in almost anything, if you're being honest about it, I think we would say that we are still doing it for the investments. It's just what kind of timeline and horizon, right? So if it's like a 10 year hold, a 20 year hold, if we're wise about the way in which we want to do some of this, we're trying to, make that money grow to work for us, right? So I would say that it's still uh, profit driven in many ways. It's not ideological in, in terms of like, oh, now we are a bit, we're not even, it can stop us from being censored, for example. And I don't see that in Asia. I, I don't think Asia really functions that way very much in terms of, well, I oh, think a, it's Asia ideological. Is probably a lot more collectivistic, right? Versus the US where you see, you know, we have this individualistic, you know, sense and, you know, the early crypto adopters in the US were gun toting libertarians, you know, you know, the government's out to get you kind of folks. And, you know, I just don't see that in Asia. So I don't know if that's where you're getting at, but. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. It's pretty much what I'm getting at, to be honest. It's not to say we don't buy the, 
decentralized ethos, if, if you would. But I think the idea is, is that it's not the be all and all solution and neither is it a counter government or anti government kind of scenario. It's something that we will look at more as I think the way that we look at other investments as well. Can this form a, a solid part of our thesis and how would we approach this along the way? I think in that sense, there is more interest for sure. In terms of I, the chatter on the ground that here around me, what you hold, are you a hodler, uh, are you a trader? I think there is more interest uh, uh, as a, as an anecdote, I had a friend who was, who was, who was sharing me the other day when he was uh, on the way to, to another meetup. And he's like, man, I'm going to get in a car accident. This cab driver is trading Bitcoin while he's driving. <laughs> so uh, at the same time, that's also, you know, we always say if, if the, the average person is talking about it, maybe it's time to take a little bit of profits, right? And see where that's going to go. But I, I've gotten at least it, yeah. 20 text messages about Dogecoin in the last two weeks. Ah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's quite funny. Uh, and the thing is that the people that I hang out with go like, okay, you know, Elon's at it again. He's, he's shilling Doge in some way. Or Doge, right? So yeah, it's, it's, uh, but at the same time, of course, I think to, to balance it out, if you do have institutional money coming in, then definitely the price is supposed to move. Uh, if we, if it moves the way that we imagine it, right? And when that happens, then you would, I mean, there is a, there is a point in which it will take off and not come back to these kind of levels again, so to speak. Um, and if that's the case, then we can't just look at the retail person coming in either to say, oh, now it's time to sell because we do want the final adoption. And I think that's something to so do as well. You said something interesting there. You said it will take off. And so what do you mean by it? Do you mean Bitcoin? Do you mean crypto? Do you mean alts? What do you bucket into it? Right, right. So in specific to this conversation, when I was talking, when I was thinking about it, I already meant, I already meant Bitcoin. Because I think it's still and I like think the everybody grand means Bitcoin when they say it now, which is kind right. of interesting. Yes, yes, I, I think that's because in the in the public's mind, at least, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain are pretty much still the same thing in many ways. You have the you have the maximalists, and I'm not one because I still hold other investments and I still hold uh, other tokens, which it's is a why syndicator we bag holder. In this space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know. The fact that we are investing in the space, I feel it's kind of strange if you are a maximalist because otherwise you can't really look at other plays, right? If you're a maximalist, you only look at Bitcoin, then it depends on how you're going around that. Of course, because now you have DeFi maybe building on top of Bitcoin as a potential. And, and so why doesn't Tembusu allocate to Bitcoin then? That's a good question. I actually have tried to uh, convince some of the partners to, to, to do that or convince uh, the chairman to do that. I think, uh, I think that it's what so i mean when you say allocate you mean like the balance sheet like yeah, uh, to, i'm just like, saying okay. with the fund or the balance sheet like you know why why put a couple million dollars in play in clayton and Blockstack and this travel company but not put you know some capital into bitcoin or at least you know the the cash that you have on hand right right so well i can i think that's part of my work uh to go into I mean, our little ecosystem and go like, and it's something I did bring up recently, actually. And I, I hope, I, I, I think it's promising maybe that we would put some allocation in the, when we do a next fund, because I think that is, that only makes sense. If you're a blockchain fund, you should have some holdings in Bitcoin and ETH in some way, in some form. Of course, is it long only? I, I would think so, to be honest, because we don't trade. We, we don't give any of the money to do prop shops to trade either at this point in time. But I am hoping to build in-house a sort of multi-strategy fund, right? Where you can allocate some maybe into Bitcoin and ETH holdings, purchases of the secondary markets, and then also some to primary. Although maybe sticking a lot more to primary because that's what we've done mostly. And so, yeah, a, a few questions, a uh, few final questions. So the first question is ETH and an ETH allocation. And so I'm interested in knowing what your thesis is around Ethereum. And if you believe that all of DeFi and all these applications being built on top of Ethereum means that Ethereum should accrue value. Oh, you mean like the Fed protocol thesis? That's exactly what I mean. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think that ETH will continue to accrue value in some way, in some form, partially because of the ridiculous gas fees at this point in time. <laughs> I, I kid you not, I have never paid so much gas fees as I did the other day when I tried to move exactly Aave off my MetaMask and into an account 
Did yeah, you pay like, like 30 or 40 bucks or something? No. I, I was like, are you shitting? I guess I say that, but say it. Are, are, are you kidding? shitting me? Let's let's hear it. Let's hear it. What do yeah, you, what'd are you, you pay? Are you absolutely kidding me? Like it's mad. I paid 175 bucks in gas fees recommended. What? And the slow and the slow one was 160. I was like, are you kidding me? I, I would have just kept my ridiculous. Ave. I, even if I knew it was going to crash, I'd be like, I cannot justify paying these gas fees. I mean, it's it's so ridiculous. We gave we gave all of our um, we gave a lot of our employees bonuses in crypto. Those that hadn't ever played around with crypto before, because we wanted to encourage yeah. people just to be a little bit degenerate and to just yeah. have fun on exchanges and trade nonsense. And uh, you know, we had like some USDC sitting around. We had no ETH, so I transferred ETH from my personal wallet just to pay the gas fees. And I like transferred like 80 bucks and it wasn't enough that I transferred like another 80 bucks and another, I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, it's just. No, exactly. So my, my, my point about that was that I think it will continue to accrue value, but maybe not in the way that people imagine the Fed protocol thesis, right? So just because things are building on top of it doesn't mean the underlying will grow really, really fat in that sense. But I do think the gas fees, if they don't solve it, will become a a way in which it accrues value, but also be a way that pisses people off enough that they will move elsewhere, <laughs> right? So is it going to accrue a value still? And over time, I think so, yes, especially as you move towards ETH 2.0, right? Which the technical details, I am not like super aware of in terms of, of that, but in terms of rollout, it's going to take stages and what they're going to do along the way and how complicated it gets to actually roll it out. There will still be speculators. There will be people who think the value is going to accrue. I think that given current prices, it still can accrue. How much it's really gonna become is a big question mark, which I am not willing to put everything on, because you do have other competitors and you do have, like example, for example, Blockstack, trying to connect directly to Bitcoin itself because they believe Bitcoin is where the real value is and where the real money is, and then bringing all the solutions directly onto Bitcoin itself because they bound themselves pretty much to Bitcoin. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, so I personally have a small ETH allocation and my thesis is also, I don't believe that ETH should accrue value because things are built on top of it. But my, my perspective is that enough people believe that, that I should allocate into it. It doesn't matter that I don't believe it, but I think enough people believe it. I mean, I hear people talk about ETH being like the ETF for DeFi um, right. in a way, which is an interesting thesis. And so I guess if enough people believe it, it will accrue value. It's true. It's true. The market, the market will move itself in certain directions in some way as well. And you don't, don't want to miss out on that um, in, in many ways. But I do think that I, I am interested to see how DeFi can be built on top of Bitcoin itself and to allow the Bitcoin ecosystem to grow. Because I think that that's really proven itself over time, right? Being the original in that sense in many ways. And I, I think that will be something interesting that's going to play out this year. Yeah, I mean, I think I think broadly speaking, in my my opinion, like just watching things be built using layer two Bitcoin scaling solutions is very, very interesting because obviously nobody wants to pay you know fees to actually transact on the Bitcoin network because that would be way worse than paying gas fees. Um, so so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly in the same boat as you. And then so my next I got about two, two or three final questions. My next question sure. is, are we in alt season or are we in Bitcoin season right now? Are we? If I had to answer either one, I would say that we are a little bit more in alt season if I had to really split it down that way, right? Because that's where you see, I mean, you see Aave that's really taking off. Uh, it's new all-time highs. You've got other coins with new all-time highs and you've got these DEXs with all-time highs. If that's not alt season, then I, I'm definitely excited for alt season, <laughs> stuff, right? Um, then but, my bags are going to do really well. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And the thing is that I think that with NC coming in, the, the time frames do change a little bit. And I don't think we can use our original like alt season because he's an alt season because he's an as the very clear guidelines. Because if the institutions are gonna come in very clearly and we do have a lot more adoption as we've been speaking about for a little bit, if we do see that then a lot of the different parts of the ecosystem are gonna gain value just based on what people are interested to try out. Right. And I, I think that's not gonna be as clear anymore. And so what worries you most about crypto and what has you most excited? Excited is I think that we will see move more and more movement into the space. So I'm thinking of what Moonit tweeted a while ago, that the best moonshot that you can have 
right now is to become a blockchain developer. That's the real moonshot there because the, the amount of demand that you would have and things like that as well. Um, but I think it's still early and we don't have enough blockchain developers. So I think as you see more developers in the space, then you would have more movement in the space. Right? And I think that's what I'm excited about. I'm trying to, I'm excited to see what people build, how creative people can get. What I kind think of I saw a stat that with. it was like under 20,000 blockchain developers. I mean, it's a tiny number. It is. It's a fraction of what it could be, right? It's so tiny uh, at this point in time. I mean, I don't know the official numbers. I just know that it's really a small amount, right? And that's also the exact reason why one of the companies that I'm speaking to and and, 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 and I'm pretty interested in is not focusing on that because now the institutional is the one that is can really create waves. And what they've done is to really target the institutional players and it has really made a lot of headway into that space. Uh, with some of the, this one in this case, literally, uh, actual blue chip finance players. So that's going to be an interesting conversation. Uh, hopefully we, we, we might pull the trigger on that one. If not, maybe I, I'll try and find a way to do a personal allocation. <laughs> but yeah, so for me, that's what's exciting. I think the amount of change that can come in this space and also just by decentralizing certain things, what new ways of architecting things can come about, right? I think on that note, I'm not, I'm not sure why we're so surprised when even money is digitalized nowadays. You know, we digitalize everything right now, social lives, on social media. We've done it for numerous other areas. But it surprises me at times how surprised we are when money itself is becoming digital. It shouldn't really surprise us given that everything is becoming digital. I mean, I have, I have not taken cash out of the bank in probably since COVID started. I have not gone to the bank and taken cash out. And I just haven't gone to cash businesses. Um, I just, I mean, it's inevitable. I mean, and, and you see it in Asia already. Like, uh, you know, I know, I forgot what it's called in Singapore, but I lived in Hong Kong uh, when I was in high school. And back then we had something called an octopus card, which is this little card. You go to the parking garage, you tap it. You go on the subway, you uh, tap right. it. You go here, you tap yeah. like, yeah. it. Like digital money has been a thing in Asia forever. And so I think, you know, it's, you know, it's inev inevitable in the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. In Singapore, we call it, we call it easy link. Easy link, yeah. easy link. Cool. And so thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Do you have any, anything else you wanted to add, get out? And if not, would love for you to just, you know, again, let us know where people can find out about Timbusu and I'll put your personal Twitter, which is going to be a lot of letters to spell out in the, uh, in the, in <laughs> yeah, the bio. Right. But uh, yeah, that's if you right. have anything, anything else to say or just where people can find out about Timbusu. No, no, not really. I mean, thanks for having me on the show. And it's, uh, I, I just, I mean, so like we talked about, it's the first time we're going to do a video version. That's interesting as well. That was unexpected for me, but it's been a pleasure. It's been fun. Definitely hope to have more conversations and also to see this community grow. So I'll leave the details to, to Josh to, to put it out, but if not, you can contact, people can contact me at my email, which is bundle at Awesome. Thank you, Anne.